how to add value to industrial properties. Watch this video if you want to find out how to apply a value add strategy to this amazing CRE asset class. Ron from Ron Rody Law, and while investing in industrial real estate can be a great way to make money, there are a lot of nuances within the asset class of industrial. It's a very broad asset class. And in this video, I'm going to walk through several of the more popular ways to make money in industrial, specifically value add with a one to two to three year hold period. We're going to talk about value add. And I think this gets thrown around a lot. If you watch these videos and you see these multifamily gurus, everybody talks about value add. I need another value add multifamily class C, class B investor, like I need a hole in my head. But that doesn't mean that what they're saying is wrong. I think it's just a very difficult niche to make money in because there's so much competition. There are a lot of people that know how to do value add and they're all searching for the same product. They're all bidding on the same properties and using the same debt sources, the same lenders, everything. Returns and their pref returns are all identical. So all the terms again you're not compete you're competing for the same equity investors you're competing for the same debt you're competing for the same properties and i think that makes it very difficult to actually execute a value add multifamily class b class c plan so why is this important to you? Because you can execute a value add industrial plan. If you follow this channel, you know that I love it. It encompasses everything from supply chain, manufacturing, light manufacturing, rail, you have warehouse, distribution, um, outdoor storage, you have all sorts of property types within industrial. And there is a wide range of ways to make money in industrial doing value add. And what does value add mean? I think that very broadly, it just means taking an existing property, giving a valuation on the current basis of what it actually is worth in its current form, doing something. And, and, and that can be uh, renovations, that can be zoning, that can be a construction, uh, repositioning, you know, adding demising walls, uh, adding multi-tenant from a single tenant, whatever it is, it's taking some active energy, some equity, executing a plan, and then creating more value once the rents have come up or there is a, a direct path with less unknowns about achieving that path of higher revenue. That's it. I mean, ultimately, that is what's value add, right, is bringing more money into a property than was previously potentially there or potentially likely. Uh, I, I say that because in one of our topics, we're going to talk about just basically reducing uncertainty, reducing risk. And for a lot of value add investors, if you can eliminate that risk, you can unlock value even without seeing a dollar of revenue. If you can just decrease uncertainty for other investors, they're going to pay you more for that site because you're crossing kind of this imaginary threshold of very speculative revenue nature into making it much more tangible and more concrete, other investors will pay you for that. All right, so let's talk about, you know, the, the general types of value add. And I think this is something very similar that we've seen in multifamily, which is you take a uh, existing building, a multi-tenant. So if you want to keep that multifamily uh, analogy going, it's a multi-tenant, maybe it's a flex building, maybe it's distribution, whatever. Uh, and you do improvements that the tenants value that in return, when their leases are, dip for, are up for renewal, they pay you a higher market rate. So again, same analogy, we're talking paint, we're talking landscaping, we're talking about upgrading the capital equipment. This could be doors, this could be adding um, dock high, this could be adding grade level uh, doors. It, it, it's really anything, uh, raising the ceiling height, if that's an easy thing to do, I know it's not, but maybe in certain areas where the ceiling height was brought down, whatever. If there's something that you know the tenants will value and that will help their business either uh, get more money into the business, fit more product under the same footprint, whatever, adding a mezzanine, that type of value add will allow the tenant to pay you more in rent. That is value add in the industrial space, but it's different. It's complicated because you're not just dealing with this same type of residential box. You don't just have the same apartment unit over and over that you put granite countertops on and it's cookie cutter in that regard. Every industrial building is a little bit different. You have to know the tenants. You have to know their business. And now 
instead of having a great place to live, you have different industrial tenants that have wildly different businesses. So again, unless you're within that vein of distribution, 3PLs, um, shipping and receiving, but you know, those can be similar, but otherwise you're dealing with plumbers, you're dealing with uh, concrete companies, you're dealing with scaffolding, bicycle manufacturer, whatever. You have to learn about what adds value to them, what adds value to the space. You do that improvement and then they're going to pay you higher rent. So that's number one is add value to existing tenants um, by doing some improvements and allowing the rents to come up. And also this may take time. So if you know in the beginning of the video, I talk about this is a value add plan that may take one, two or three years because when you buy a building, the leases could be longer than the next six to 12 months. You may have 24 months until a particular lease is due. So the value add timeline is a little bit stretched depending on the lease terms for those tenants. Now let's talk about the second way. And this second way, I'm gonna to jump to it, is, is the home run. You know, I think that short of new construction, new development buildings, this is the highest return, this is the highest equity multiple, but it also represents the highest risk. It's like, oh, ah, yes I do. <laughs> Funny. For an existing building. So that's the caveat. It's not new construction risk, but it's the highest risk for uh, buying an existing building, and that's buying a vacant building. So for whatever reason, the owner moved out, uh, the tenant vacated, the landlord couldn't find or wouldn't find a new tenant, and you can buy a building for pennies on the dollar. So we're roughly talking in DFW uh, 2022, it's like $40 a foot. I think that's generally pretty low um, just for the, for the building, not including land costs, but that's way below replacement. That depending on the, the, the bones and the infrastructure of the building, that's a pretty good price. You buy this building for $40 a foot, let's say it's a 10, 20, 30, 40,000 square foot building, you're in for one six, that's just your cost, you know, that, that has a time value of money, that has opportunity costs, you have carrying costs that are very high now, you have property taxes, insurance, and those are all racking up uh, after you've purchased this property. You execute a plan to do some value add. I think what is, uncommon is you buying a building and necessarily being able to source that tenant uh, just without doing any work. If that were the case, usually that tenant would find the building first and say, this is suitable, I want to lease it, or the prior owner would have been able to find a tenant and procure that tenant, sign a lease, and then exit for a lot higher value. So I generally don't think that this value add of placing a tenant, you can do nothing. You have to either have a different type of connection, maybe you have a tenant in tow that doesn't know about this building or doesn't know that they want the building. So if you have a tenant in tow, or you're going to do some type of visionary remodeling that's going to drastically change this building such that other prospective tenants now realize that they could be in this space. And so again, let me just give you a little example. So that 40,000 square foot building, you buy it vacant for 40 a foot, you put 10 or $20 a foot to um, expand or re-stripe the parking lot and suddenly you have this beautiful truck court and you add a couple of sorry dock high doors with this expanded truck court. So previously you took kind of a rundown dinky little building that didn't look like it could f support a a distribution facility. It was a small distribution facility and you've invested a, a pretty significant sum, right? So we're talking like a hundred thousand dollars on uh, a nice truck court and installing dock high doors, maybe three or four dock high doors. Boom. Now the pool of tenants who are interested in this building, once the work has been completed, they see it and now they're willing to sign a lease. And now you can get a lease for, I won't quote market rates, but whatever that lease is for a distribution facility of this size in that market. And you can turn around with that long-term lease and sell it for $150 a foot. Uh, I'll, I'll say you can do it because my clients have done it. What it takes is six to nine months of hold period. Um, in this market, you know, is a little bit compressed because you had tenants willing to sign a new lease before you were quite finished. In a normal period, I'd call it nine months and maybe in a, a extended amount of delay, you may have to hold the property for 12 months before you have a tenant. And that's a lot of risk. I agree, that is, that is scary. To somebody who doesn't have unlimited equity, unlimited cash flow, holding a property for 12 months and making a full year's worth of payments on everything, not to mention your purchase price, not to mention the improvements, 
you're you're nervous. Uh, at least I would be about finding a tenant. Is this going to work? Am I actually providing value to a tenant? And does somebody want this space in the new configuration that I've created? But if you can do that, that is value add in in some of the biggest ways because now you've made a hundred dollars a foot. That's a nice, healthy profit depending on your risk tolerance, and it's fast. It's faster really than waiting for existing tenant leases to expire and sign and renew them. It's faster than uh, building new construction, permitting and plans and approvals, all that. So this is a really unique spot is if you can find tenants, if you can bring tenants to a building, if you can make some small adaptations to an existing building and create a new use, that is is really, you know, I think the, the epitome of value add in industrial. Let me contrast this to what is a market value purchase. And I think it's important to understand if you say you're a value add industrial investor, what is the alternative? I think the alternative then would be market value in which you're paying a premium or you're paying market price for a stabilized asset that is has a high likelihood of generating long term returns. So this again is going to be purchasing a building with a stabilized tenant. We're talking at least five years left on the lease, but they are are stable. They've been in business. You're not trying to rock the boat. You're not trying to execute some type of plan. You're solely wanting to buy the property and execute your return. Just collect. It's just coupon clipping. And so that's the alternative. You need to decide, am I a value add investor and make that mindset and, and figure out where your niche is? Or are you a market value? And there's nothing wrong with either one. I, I, I don't want to down play the market value investor because they're still making good money. You know, they're able to deploy a lot of capital. They're able to put a lot of assets under management, but it is largely hands off after acquisition, after transitioning the tenant. You just want to fix your debt to match your lease term. You go through those payments and you and you coupon clip. You know, you'd make those distributions to your investors. Finally, let's talk about land development that's not quite new construction. I'm going to save new construction for another video because it is a huge, huge can of worms that has a lot of issues these days. But I'm going to talk about development solely in the sense of adding value to an existing plot. So let's take farmland, which is, you know, the, the most raw natural state of land that we commonly have um, west of the Mississippi. So you can look at farmland and it will probably be zoned a certain type of use, say agriculture or, or something like that. What you can do is create a vision for that land. How can it best be used in terms of commercial, residential, industrial, manufacturing? What What is the best type of use? You can start to create a master plan of parcels and you say, this is my industrial park. These are the types of buildings I'm going to have. This is the size. This is the density. This is the parking. This is the drainage. This is the runoff. Here's my streets. Here's my access. I have a turn lane. I'm going to pay for a street light. All of these things help solidify your plans so that you can go to the city and say, I would like a zoning change. I would like a variance. Because if something was previously zoned for, say, commercial, and it's just a vacant lot as commercial, you can't build an industrial warehouse with 35-foot clear heights. You just can't under that existing zoning. So somebody that comes in and says, this is the perfect place for a small warehouse with 35-foot clear heights, I'm going to purchase the land or at least tie it up under contract. I'm going to uh, create plans. I'm going to draw, create a site plan, right? So these are actual architect drawings or engineer drawings of the plot and what the dimensions of the building, parking, the number of parking spaces, alleys, you know, trash pickup, all that stuff, um, truck routes, truck court. And you're going to present it to the city to ask for a variance on the zoning so that you can build an industrial zoning type of building that will generate a lot of profit for the ultimate developer. Now, the, the key difference is where you are in the development stage. What I've just described is very early. It is, it is very early in terms of maybe you don't even buy the property, right? So you're just putting something under contract. You may or may not have hard earnest money. And, but these are very long due diligence periods. We're usually talking 90, 120 days, at which point some money usually goes hard. If you have a good lawyer, 
and you're the seller, you have money go hard. If you have a good lawyer on the buyer, you still don't have any money go hard, but maybe you put additional funds down so that you can keep the contract open for an additional 60 days. So what you do during that time is you come up with a plan. Again, you have to spend some money, your architects, your engineers, you have to have a consultant uh, present to the city. But if you can get that variance approved in the first 120 days or the 120 plus 60 days, you have unlocked tremendous value from what used to be just a commercial lot that nobody really wanted to build another strip mall. Nobody wanted to build a freestanding Chipotle on the site that was worth, you know, three to five million dollars for a freestanding Chipotle. If you've changed the zoning now to industrial and you've gotten the city on board with building this 35 foot uh, monstrosity, now you've unlocked a 15 million, a 20 million dollar building and subsequently they'll pay you five million for the dirt that you paid or, or, or under contract for say one million. And so now you can have that delta because of your work. So let's say you make four million dollars from changing the zoning. I'm not saying it's an easy thing, but it is up, uh, on a spectrum of the types of paper, zoning as a matter of right, or uses as a matter of right, that you can unlock for your future developers. And other investors will buy you that paper and that land because of the unique government uh, zoning or regulatory approvals that it already has. Um, I've, I've glossed over some of those other regulatory approvals, but that's the gist is that you can take a piece of land zoned and, and approved for one thing, transform it as approved by right for another thing and increase the value. So this is another way that industrial is so flexible. You know, I think this is applicable to multifamily as well, but it's not as common that you see people working on entitlements and um, zoning for, for multifamily. I mean, you do, but I, I think it's more possible for smaller plots in industrial. These are all similar concepts across all types of commercial real estate. But with industrial, you have a lot more variance. You have a lot higher frequency of single tenant uses, which produces this feast or famine um, outcome. And I think that's a higher appetite for risk. So for most multifamily, you're always going to have some cash flow. You're always going to have some tenant base while you execute a value add plan. With a single tenant, you really run that uh, do I have a lease? Do I have cash flow or not? And that can scare people off, but don't be scared. Budget out your expenses. Make sure you have a comfortable hold period. You have the reserves to wait it out and subscribe for more commercial real estate content. We'll see you next time.